in six. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for And certain of what we do not see Now faith is being sure of what we hope for And certain of what we do not see To please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. That He exists and that He those who earnestly seek Him Now faith is being sure of what we hope for And certain of what we do not see Now faith is being sure of what we hope for And certain of what we do not see To please God Because anyone who comes to Him Must believe And without faith It is impossible To please God Because anyone who comes to Him Must believe That He exists And that He rewards Those who earnestly seek Him That He exists And that He What about now? Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it didn't have to even whack it this time. <laughs> Would you please rise and join me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin? Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Please remain standing and join in singing the hymn in your purple hymnal number 370. This is My Father's World.
please be seated and welcome to worship on this Father's Day. And we have a tribute to fathers in just a moment, but a few announcements as we get started. We have a picnic this coming Friday at 6 o'clock out in the pavilion. We'll be serving hot dogs and chips. Uh, come out and join that, and if you want to stay for a movie, there'll be a showing of Ruth, the Sight and Sound Theater version of it at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So it'll be nice and cool and... Uh, and no bugs or anything, just yeah, come on out and enjoy. Uh, congratulations to Bethany Wood Egger and Riley Egger on their wedding yesterday, a beautiful ceremony, and uh, congratulations to those two. And we do have the Operation Christmas Child Gift of the Heart Packing Party coming up July 31st that we are gathering supplies for, and you can certainly find plenty of information about that over here on the tables uh, to my right. Do we have any other announcements? Yes, Tammy? Uh, we have a lunch and learn next Sunday. Oh, next Sunday. Okay, very good. Next Sunday is a lunch and learn. And I believe you have a guest speaker. Yeah, what, yeah, what is she going to be talking about? She's going to be talking about. I'm sorry, if you look in your bulletin. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I so it's, it's with Janelle Binder, and she's going to be coming and talking to her to us about helping families at home this year. Oh. She also works with a lot of uh, refugee families, and so there's a lot of needs that are coming into the community, and there's not a lot of support. Yeah. She's going to talk about that. Oh, yeah, yeah very interesting. Okay, so that'll just be immediately following service next Sunday. Yes. Awesome. And uh, Dee? I'm going to pass a sign-up sheet around for Friday night so we know how many hot dogs to buy. Awesome. Very good. All right. Other announcements for the good of the body? As we... All right. I uh, do want to go ahead now with a, um, a video tribute to fathers, and then we will offer a prayer. Oops, second. Today is a special day, and it's bigger than we think. Because there are many different kinds of fathers, and they all need to be recognized and honored today. Today we honor those fathers who consistently strive to balance loving their wives and children with being good, godly workers at their jobs. May you feel the pleasure of God. Today, we honor those dads who had poor fathers themselves, but who have committed never to become the father they grew up under. May your children continue to be guarded from any of the hurt you carry. Today, we honor the fathers who are older and who no longer have day-to-day -day obligations to their own children. May the family gatherings this weekend make you feel like you could do it all over again. Today, we honor the adult children of fathers who are absent. May the God of the fatherless become your father in ways you've only dreamed of. And may you believe with your whole heart that his leaving wasn't your fault. Today, we honor men who have no children of their own, but who father younger men as mentors and guides. May you see your important roles as impacting and life-changing. And finally today, we honor fathers who have passed away. May their good deeds live on through you, and may their careless deeds be corrected in your lifetime. Today is a special day. So for all the fathers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be honored, be blessed, and be joyful. We believe that you have what it takes to change the world and you're doing it one relationship at a time. Happy Father's Day. And I see I got things a little out of order, so we'll come back for the children's message in just a moment. Uh, but at this time, I would like to 
on our, on our Father's Day with a special prayer. If you would bow your heads and pray with me. A heavenly Father, we pray for your blessing and protection on all you have called into fatherhood. We pray for young fathers, newly embracing their calling. May they find a balance to work and family and faith. We pray for seasoned fathers around the world. May their wisdom be a blessing to all around them. For fathers who are lacking a good model, who have worked hard to become a good father, we pray for men who are not fathers but still mentor and guide with fatherly love. We remember fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers who are no longer with us but who live forever in our hearts and whose memories nourish us. And Heavenly Father, we especially think of you and your incredible lavish love shown to us through your son Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would please stand and join us in our response, glory be to the Father. could have the children come forward for a special Father's Day children's message led by Rhonda Obermeyer. going to ask you what day it is, but I think you should know by what pastor just played, what day is it today? Is it a special day? Is it Mother's Day? Is it Father's Day? Yeah. How many of you did something special for that special person in your life today? What? Well, I have a Bible verse that tells you something about fathers, and it comes from Proverbs 4, 1, and it says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instructions. Pay attention and gain understanding. So the Bible verse tells us we should listen to our father, right? And, and do what he tells us to do. How many of you think that your dads are much wiser, smarter, have much more experience than you do in life. Raise your hand. Go ahead, don't be shy. Okay, raise them high, you should be proud of that. So they probably know more than you guys know because you're pretty young yet, so they have a lot to teach you. Well, I have 10 most popular, wisest things that a father has ever said. You wanna hear them? Number 10 is, and raise your hand if you have ever heard, and the congregation can raise their hands too, but raise your hand if you have ever heard your father or that special person who takes care of you in your life, if you've ever heard them say this, okay? But raise your hands really high. The first one is, why? Because I said so, that's why. <laughs> Me too. Number nine is, just wait till you have kids of your own. <laughs> I say that to my kids. What did I just finish telling you? <laughs> Number seven is, 
this is going to hurt me more than it does you. <laughs> I heard that a lot. Do I look like I'm made of money? <laughs> Not now, I'm watching the game. Number four is, when you get hurt, don't come running to me. <laughs> Number three is, no, we're not lost. <laughs> My husband says that a lot. He refuses to ask for directions. Number two, would you just be quiet? Can't you see I'm trying to think? Yeah, Julia said that's a good one. And the number one saying of a wise father is, I don't know, go ask your mother. <laughs> yep, we've all heard that one. So maybe your fathers don't know all the answers, but we do have a heavenly father that knows all the answers, and we can always go to him for answers. So on this Father's Day, we should thank our fathers for everything that they've done for us and also ask your heavenly father to guide them in teaching you everything that you need to know about our heavenly father. And we're going to have a prayer, but after the prayer, I have some hugs up here. And they're candy hugs. I want you to take at least two, since there's not very many. At least two. You can have some more if you want. But I want you to keep one for yourself, and I want you to give one to that special person in your life, your dad, or it may be somebody that's taking care of you, give them the other hug. And I know somebody that really likes chocolate, Stephanie. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for our fathers. Help us this day to show our love and appreciation to our fathers. And may we always remember to thank you, our Heavenly Father. Amen.
Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, April. I think, I don't know if I've ever seen so many toes tap in from sitting out front here. <laughs> Today, the scripture is what my dad calls the greatest story ever, the greatest storyteller's greatest story ever told. Um, um, the, and it's Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, then 11 through 32. Um, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today to read your word and learn more about you. We pray that as your scripture is read, you would open our hearts and open our ears to hear what it is that you have to say to us today. Amen. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus continued, There was a young man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered to his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God bless the reading of his word. The lost and found. I don't know why they call it the lost and found. Right? Everything in here is still lost. It should just be called the lost. I mean, if somebody finds it, hopefully they make off with it. Yeah, I, I brought this out about 10 years ago and lifted a few items up, and nobody ever claimed them. I, I always wonder, how do people not miss some stuff like this? But it's a pretty good backpack. And uh, there's you know, children's coats in here. Uh, someone even lost a belt. I, 
other coats and so forth, toys. There's a dinosaur. Luke chapter 15 has been called the lost and found desk of the Bible because Jesus gives a series of lessons about what was lost, namely people who are lost and the fact that they are found. He starts off with the parable of the lost sheep in which a shepherd has a hundred sheep, one of them wanders off, and the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes in search of the lost sheep. And when he finds it, he throws a party. And Jesus says, I assure you, there is more celebration in heaven over one lost sheep who is found than over the 99 who never wandered away in the first place. And no doubt that angered the Pharisees who were listening that day. But it gives you an idea of how much it pains our Lord when one of his children wanders away from him. And then he tells the parable of the lost coin in which a woman lost a coin in her house. And it says that she searched diligently until she found it. She made a federal case out of this lost coin. She calls her friends over, come and celebrate with me. I found my coin. And so Jesus is saying that if you have a loved one, who has wandered away from God, be assured that it has not escaped the notice of your heavenly Father. He knows that. And he is sending search parties out to find those who are lost. You might be someone called by the Lord to go and help recover somebody who has been lost because he loves them. And then he tells the parable of the two lost sons. And some call it the greatest short story ever told. And I call it the greatest storyteller's greatest story. Every Christian should know the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the two lost sons, by heart. And Christians should be able to practically recite it word for word. It is a story about two lost sons. The characters, you have the younger son, a sniveling little brat, and the older son, a sniveling big brat. They kind of represent two ways that people wander away from God. And there are other ways, of course. Jesus uh, said in one parable that people just get busy. They, they, they are enamored with busyness. And they let that crowd out the Lord. But here you have a younger son who goes off and chases, I guess, what you could best call us, things that are immoral. And the Greek here that is translated wild living, in the uh, King James, I think it says riotous living, has the idea of recklessness. There's kind of a disregard for the consequences on the future of what this son is doing. He's pleasure seeking. And he separates from God. Might be the kind of person who thinks God is boring. So I'm going to go off and engage in highly exciting but questionable behavior. And this younger son is not some teenager off to sow wild oats. This teenage, this son, is going for broke. He's taking the inheritance and he is moving far, far away. He's done. He's gone. He's out of there. And those hearing this story originally would have been aware of a practice that is written about in the Talmud, which is a Jewish book of ceremonial law and civil law. There was a ceremony called a ketsasa, in which if a Jewish boy lost his inheritance to a Gentile, if he ever showed up again in that village, the villagers would put burnt corn and nuts into a large vessel, smash it in front of him, yell out his name, and admit he was done. He was banished, cut off from his people. He was now an orphan. So Jesus is telling this story that perfectly fits what this Ketsasa ceremony was all about. So that's probably where they thought this was heading when they were hearing it. Well, another way to leave God is the older son way. He seemed to be set, setting about to prove that God was, in fact, boring 
because he was joyless, uh, self-righteous. He takes all the joy out of life. And in the end, it turns out that his goals, his motives are much more aligned with the younger son than he would care to admit. He isn't following God, his, his father, because he loves him. He calls it slaving. I slaved for you. And you never so much as gave me a tough old goat to party with. I've been good, so you owe me. This is the classic works righteousness. I'm going to earn my way to heaven. God owes it to me. And if you uh, are not satisfied that works righteousness is a dead end, I would say read Romans through and you will see. Paul says, Father Abraham, had he earned his way to heaven, he would have something to brag about. But he didn't. He gets to heaven because he put his faith in God, because he trusts his heavenly father. That's how he got his righteousness. Trying to earn your way to heaven is a dead end, and that's the way of the older son. And then you have the father who represents God, a kind, freedom-loving, lavishly loving dad. And you have the citizen of far, far away that the son goes to work for, a real cheapskate who cared not a whit for his hired hands. And you have the servants, the, the father's hired hands who are treated well. And the pigs, unclean animals to the Jews that the younger son has to lower himself to care for. And then you have assumed characters, right? his wild living. It's kind of left to your imagination what that might entail. Gambling buddies, drinking buddies, party animals, uh, running around with women with loose morals like his own. Whatever in your mind might constitute wild living. And the Greek has the idea of that recklessness in his behavior. And when we look at uh, parables, it's always good to step back and think about what kind of a parable this is. This one's a metaphor. The characters represent um, people, things, ideas in the world as they relate to the kingdom of heaven. It's drawn from common life experience, uh, kind of a dispute over inheritance, something that comes up now and then. But it grips us with its vividness. It's really brief, but conveys a great deal of information about the kingdom of heaven and like many parables, this one certainly has a narrative quality to it. It's countercultural. The kingdom of God is different than the way the world operates. And it certainly has multiple meanings. And it calls us to action. And the kind of parable this is is clearly a narrative parable. The narrative sequencing develops characters and ideas about the kingdom of God. And the setting is very important. Luke 15, 1 through 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So you got tax collectors kind of regarded as the scum traitors of society. You've got sinners and you've got the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, basically the lawyers of the day, sneering that this Jesus fella eats with sinners. Can you believe this guy? What kind of a Messiah is this? There was a woman some decades ago who was known as the Mother Teresa of Israel. Farida Hanna was her name. And she set up an organization that took in orphans. And she had, I think, up to 600 orphans at one time. They took in a lot of them who had profound needs, special needs. And they sold love beads in a shop to keep the doors open. They called them love beads because it could take a special needs child an hour to string one bead onto the string and to try to make the string of beads. And one time in her shop, two Americans came in. And one started to rail against the fact that she took in Arab children as well as Jewish children. And he had developed this hatred for Arabs, and he's vocally talking about this. And the other American counters him, 
and he apologizes to Farida for the other American's behavior, and she put her hand on his back, and she said, it's okay. One thing I found over the years is that a great many Americans take the Bible literally, but not seriously. They take the Bible literally, but not seriously. That's the Pharisees. They apply the law of God literally. Jesus says you will tithe down to the herbs you're growing on a pot on the back porch. You get that right. But you ought not lose track of the greater things. The greatest commandments of all, to love God and love your neighbor. That's where you're face planting every time. Your heavenly father has a big heart. He loves all of his children. One time the Pharisees even grew angry at Jesus because he was healing on the Sabbath. A man with a shriveled hand was there. And looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They just knew he couldn't help himself. He was going to have to heal on the Sabbath. So they had him here. And Jesus says, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Pointing out what hypocrites they are. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Use your common sense. Use your hearts in addition to your heads. And so the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus is showing the audience, the scribes, the Pharisees, the sinners, the tax collectors, what God is really like. Telling that God is love and God loves each one of his children. Now, to be sure, the younger son was doing evil. He asked for his inheritance while his father was alive. And in that culture, that was tantamount to telling your father, I wish you were dead. And the father, no doubt, had to liquidate assets, sell land in order to pay off the son's inheritance. What an embarrassment this would have been for him in the community. Some actions that we take have lasting consequences. And that's the case here. The son takes the money, he has no land, and he runs off and he squanders the money on fast living and falls on hard times. And those drinking buddies, where are they when he needs help? They're suddenly very hard to find. They make themselves scarce. And so he searches for help in this new community that he is in. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Diogenes. He was a, a Greek philosopher. And whenever you see a statue of him or a painting of him, he's carrying a lantern. And that's because he was famous for going around Athens in broad daylight with a lantern lit. And people would stop him and ask him, what's the deal? Why are you walking around with a lantern in the middle of the day? And he would say, I'm searching for an honest man. The younger son was searching for anybody who would give him some help. And Jesus says, no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. He was starving. Starving for food, starving for love. He was in a bad way. And then he comes to his senses. Sometimes that happens. Or suddenly come to our senses. He, he finally puts two and two together. Kind of like here, sometimes you get a little help on putting two and two together. A Coca-Cola has a 15-pack, and it lets you know that's three more cans than a 12-pack. <laughs> sometimes we just need a little help with the obvious. Yes. Does anybody know how, to, how Fruit Loops is spelled, the cereal? How do they spell the, the fruit in Fruit Loops? Yeah. Yes, it's, I, I couldn't believe it. I saw that on, I said, no, that can't be right, and I looked up a box. I, they do spell it that way. Or, you know, sometimes we just suddenly put two and two together. And the younger son puts two and two together and says, wait a minute. My father's hired hands 
have it so good. He treats them so well. And he's convinced, I can't be my father's son anymore. I've ruined that, but maybe he'll make me a hired hand and I'll be a lot better off than I am right now. Sometimes I wonder why the father granted the son's request for this early inheritance in the first place. The father's love seems even a bit reckless. Didn't he know that this could end up in trouble for his son? Uh, Clearly, our heavenly father values freedom. He gives us free will. He wants your love. He wants your respect. He wants your desire to do good, to be free, to flow from love, love in your hearts. The father must have felt that by granting this request, it was the only way to truly get his son back freely. Sometimes God accommodates us in our brokenness. There's a doctor named Richard Seltzer who wrote a book called Mortal Lessons, Notes on the Art of Surgery. And I don't know, Bob, have you ever read that one? I don't know if <laughs> it's kind of an older book. And... Um, He talks in it about a a time that he was doing surgery on a woman who had a malignant tumor on her cheek. And he got into the surgery, and as he was trying to remove the tumor, he came to the realization that he was going to have to take out uh, some major nerves in her face. There was just no way around it, and she was going to be left with a frozen face. It broke his heart to do it, but he didn't really have much choice. And so, following the surgery, he went and told her. And she asked if, you know, my face is always going to be like this. And he told her, yes, I had to do that in order to save your life. And at that moment, he said her husband bent down and gave her a kiss on the mouth. And he contorted his lips to match hers perfectly. And they looked at him and said, it's going to be okay. Sometimes God has to take actions that cause us pain in the short term in order to make sure that we are saved in the long run. And so God, the Father, granted this son's request. It ended up in hardship for the son, but it made him finally come to his senses and realize what a loving father he had. And so he makes that difficult decision to come home. He had to swallow his pride He had to worry about the villagers doing the Ketsasa ceremony. And as he comes down the road, his father spots him way off in the distance. And his father runs to him, something considered highly undignified for a Jewish man. He runs to him before the villagers can even begin to think about the Ketsasa. And he reinstates his son instantly. Bring him the best robe. Bring him the ring that signifies he's back in my good graces. Kill the fatted calf, let's throw a party. And what were the chances that this son was going to come around? CBS did a special a few years ago looking at reincarceration rates of criminals. And the stats were were very bleak. They found that 68% of 405,000 prisoners released in 30 states in 2005, were arrested for a new crime within three years. And 77% were arrested within five years. And those were just the ones who were caught. I said, undoubtedly, there were probably the smartest ones that were getting away with it. It can be hard to change old ways. It can be hard to break bad habits. But God the Father is always hopeful. Even if you've gone down the wrong road, your heavenly Father is rooting for you. He's watching for any sign of a turnaround. And in our story, the Father's greatest dream comes true. He spots his son coming down the road and he has compassion on him. Tim Keller points out that even after you are converted by the gospel, your heart will try to turn back to the old ways. You have to daily set your heart, he says, to gospel mode. 
Remember that you are loved by a God who watches over you. So set your heart to God every day. Well, at the end of the story, we get the Paul Harvey moment, the rest of the story. The older son is indignant that the father has welcomed back the wayward younger son. And the story is left open-ended. We aren't told what happens. And we hope that the older son also had a change of heart. And indeed, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and hoping that they would have a change of heart and go in and join God's party rather than sit and stew on the outside. If the parable of the prodigal son doesn't convince you of God's love, it's hard to know what will. Perhaps the cross. Truth is, you have an inheritance waiting for you. God's only son died to give it to you, an inheritance of a home with him. I'll close with a final story about Ben Hooper, who was the governor of Tennessee twice. He wrote about his childhood. He says, my mother wasn't married when I was born. When I started school in Newport, my classmates had a name for me. It wasn't very nice. I used to go off by myself at recess and at lunch because of the insults of my classmates which cut me deeply. What was worse was going downtown on Saturday afternoon. I felt like every eye in town was burning a hole through me. They all were wondering who was my real father. Hooper eventually wrote an autobiography that was sadly titled The Unwanted Boy. But things took a turn for the better when he was 12. A new preacher came to our church, he recalls. I went in late, and I planned to slip out early so I couldn't be quizzed on my family situation. But the preacher said the benediction so fast I got caught and had to walk out with the crowd. Just about the time I got to the door, I looked up, and the preacher was looking right at me. Oh, well, who are you, son? Whose boy are you? He said. I felt the old weight come upon me. But as the preacher looked down at me, studying my face, he began a big smile of recognition. Wait a minute, he said. I know who you are. I see the family resemblance. You're a son of God. With that, he slapped me across the back and said, boy, you've got a great inheritance coming. Just make sure you go claim it. That, Ben Hooper said, was the most important single sentence anyone ever said to me. With Christ's help, he said, I overcame my sense of rejection and claim my inheritance as a valued child of God. You too have a great inheritance waiting. Just make sure you go claim it. Amen. Let us join together and let us sing our closing hymn, Down to the River to Pray.
Now receive the good words, the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of your heavenly Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and indeed every day. Amen.